service is hosted by the Unitarian Church of Edmonton with friends from their faith communities in Edmonton. And this is held to honor and remember those who suffered and died during the genocide and, and for us all to do that ongoing and necessary work. To do that ongoing and necessary work of eradicating hate and bringing equity and justice. The Summer Service Series is connect, coordinated by the Canadian Unitarian Council. I am Vida Ng, Executive Director of the CUC. The coronavirus epidemic has forced us to live out our lives in significantly different ways than we had imagined at the start of 2020. But it has also opened up unimagined opportunities for us to connect like this virtually across Canada and globally. I invite you all to embrace our communities and the new discoveries that we are making and to live into new ways that allow for equitable and sustainable ways to recover as we learn from this pandemic. Welcome. Come into this place of peace and let it silence heal your Good morning. My name is Naomi McElrath and Audrey, um, I just, and everyone here, I'd like you to thank you very much for the honor to contribute in a small way to this important gathering. I was thinking about what it means to be a witness. So I'll read a poem called Witness. Witness. Look, can you see that man? Why is he moaning? Why is he bleeding? Why is he bent over? Come, let's be more than mere eyewitnesses. Let's help him. Listen, can you hear that woman? Why is she crying? Why is she screaming? What is she saying? Come, let's be more than ear witnesses. Let's help her. Wait, what's that niggling in my mind? What is this unease I feel? On the TV, what is this child's pain? On the TV, what is that child's terror? Come, let's be more than brain witnesses. Let's help this child. Stop. Can you feel that heat? Can you feel that chill? Can you feel that ache in the gut? 
Can you feel the sweat sliding down the small of your back? Come, let's be more than hand witnesses. Let's stop the bleeding. Come, let's not be spectators or bystanders or passers-by. Let's not watch the bullying, the killing, the terrorizing, and do nothing in our watching. Let's use our eyes to see the terror, our ears to hear the horror, our hands to build halls of healing, and our hearts to find the rhythm of the hearts of those who hurt. Let our hearts hurt in the work as in our work as heart witnesses. As heart witnesses, let us heal those whose hearts hurt. Let us reach out to touch the hand of the bleeding man, the hand of the bleeding woman, the hand of the screaming woman, the hand of the terrified child. Listen, can you hear that sound? That's the sound of our hearts beating. In time with the heart of the bleeding man, in time with the heart of the screaming woman, in time with the heart of the terrified child. That's the sound of the heart of our hearts beating in time with the heart of our mortal enemy, in time with the heart of our mortal friend. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Audrey? Are you able to unmute yourself? I wanted to thank Naomi for her uh, prayer for, and uh, introduce her as a Métis poet and uh, teacher and canoeer and all kinds of things. A wonderful person that's been in the community for so many years and had taught herself Cree and wrote the wonderful book, Kiyam. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Audrey. My name is Reverend Audrey Brooks. I'm the chaplain at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, a board member of the Edmonton Interfaith Center, uh, two sponsors along with the Canadian Unitarian Council of this memorial service. It is 12 years since I initiated the genocide memorial service because violent deaths happen all over the world and we must have witnesses against them. We cannot stay quiet and let it continue. It is a practice used to dominate and persecute ordinary people trying to lead ordinary and safe lives in their own countries. So each year we hold this service to honor the dead, witness to what happened to them and place stones with names on them in the memorial garden where many people visit and stop to pray. We saw on the first slides a gathering in the uh, first, one of the first memorial services, uh, several people coming together to pray, to witness, and to share stories about, this, about what was happening in their own countries. So I have to ask, Karen, what is the next uh, slide that you're showing? Um, which slide it should, do you want me it, to use? It should be ge the, the genocide. We didn't have the, uh, the, um, the slide of the red dresses. I can go back to that. Yeah. You would, to would you please? Okay. And, and then to the, the stone. Jamie Black of Winnipeg brought her red dress project to the University of Alberta several years ago to honor the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls of Canada. I was chaplain there at that time and I walked out into the winter uh, snow and I saw all of these dresses hanging all over the place. They were on fences and on, on uh, banners and in hallways. Her work has inspired other groups to continue the project in many locations. Just recently, I, I received pictures of um, a museum in Lac La Biche, Alberta, where the uh, red dresses were displayed. 
So it continues. In the larger context, I include this slide to recognize and act as witness to the millions and millions of girls and women who are deliberately murdered worldwide. And the next slide is the one of the van. This van accompanied the missing and murdered women and girls march from Vancouver to Ottawa a few years ago. And I was called and asked if we would host them while they were having their van prepared. Uh, it needed some work on it before they could start out again. So our, hosted, our, hosts, our church hosted them. And it was quite an experience to their mothers and grandmothers and elders and young teenagers. I was absolutely amazed at the power and the commitment of these people to make it all the way from BC to Ottawa to stand as witness before the legislature there for the missing and murdered women. Thank you for that slide. And now if you go to the uh, stone, This is a stone that appears in the Genocide Memorial Garden. And as you can see, it says, humanity stands in a river of its own blood. That is a quotation I found, and I could never find the author of it. But it certainly says what I want to say. This garden honors the memory of victims who died violent deaths because of wars, racism, religious persecution, sexual orientation, greed, slavery, ethnic cleansing, and appropriation of Aboriginal lands. And I have to tell you that people come to that garden and they stop and they read it. Very, very often they pray. Sometimes they talk with me. So it's been there since 2009. You can go on to the next slide. There are Stanton's eight stages of genocide. We have to ask, how do we affirm that all people in the world have inherent worth and dignity, have a right to freedom, safety, and the right to a decent life, when in every country there are those who would deny billions of our human family this right? Stanton declares that there are stages, eight stages of genocide. And we see this rising among us today. Unfortunately, history repeats itself. People are labeled according to race, religion, sexual orientation, political belief. There are assigned negative symbols. We know about the yellow star and the pink triangle. We know that they're called terrible names like rapists and murderers as happened with refugees and GLBTQ people across the world who are escaping persecution by becoming refugees in other countries. People are incited to hate each other. It's hate groups are encouraged to attack and abuse them, even in countries that are supposed to be liberal and democratic. I heard on the news this morning that the Chinese are being vilified for the uh, COVID virus vandalism and, and abuse on the streets. And this is Canada, folks. This is Canada. Governments are making laws. They say will protect the state and the economy and they use military and police forces to jail, torture and murder masses of people and then deny that they're doing it. They destroy families by separating them from their children who are jailed and the parents deported terrible acts of violence against helpless people are justified. We gather here today to affirm that there is a blood tie among us and it must lead us to resist abuses of power. We already know that any form of violence to one of us wherever we live in the world is an assault on all of humanity. It doesn't matter if it's happening over there and is overkill in terms of information from the media. So we kind of get uh, used to it. 
This service is one step forward each year that challenges us to speak out from our positions of faith and never stop challenging power that has as its goal the destruction of life and devastation of land just because they can. Our next speaker is Rabbi Gila Kane from Beth Ora Synagogue in Edmonton. She'll introduce our first topic, which uh, uh, Naomi uh, uh, spoke about in her poem, Topic of Witness to Genocide. Rabbi Gila, please. Okay, um, shalom and thank you, Reverend Brooks, for uh, creating the sacred space for all of us and to all who are here to be with us in this space. I'll just share that about 14 years ago, during one of the wars, um, we were living in a city that was constantly under bombardment and sirens would go off a few times every day and the streets were mostly empty. And I recall that one day I was looking out of our balcony onto the street and there were a few children playing outside in the street and this was their game. They walked up and down the street making siren sounds and calling out, everybody go into the shelters, everybody go into the shelters. I remember just watching them doing that. When I think of witnessing, it's being at once close enough to the situation and removed from it, experiencing what is happening now at this moment, and at the same time allowing it to arrive in our memory without overtaking us completely. Witnessing is also the act of recognizing how events affect not just the actors themselves, but ripple out and around creation. For this, I'll read uh, one poem by Yehuda Amichai, and I'll just share my screen here so you can all see this poem. The diameter of the bomb was 30 centimeters and the diameter of its destruction about seven meters, and in it four killed and 11 wounded. And around these in a large circle of pain and time are scattered two hospitals and one cemetery. But the young woman who is buried in the place from where she came at a distance of more than 100 kilometers enlarges the circle considerably. And the lonely man who is mourning her death in a distant country incorporates into the circle the whole world. And I won't speak of the cry of the orphans that reaches God's chair and from there makes the circle endless and godless. And I would like to add that perhaps our witnessing and our being here in this sacred circle and in this sacred space um, can perhaps uh, bring in some, um, some sacredness back into this, um, some of God back into the world. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to add to that, that I was, uh, as pastorally, I was taking care of a, a, an elderly German fellow who actually painted all the, uh, the uh, signs in the German Cultural Association, if you've ever been there. And his name was Erwin Krohn. And he said that uh, af after the war, they were cleaning up the streets of the, the bodies of the dead. And he said uh, that he went into a little archway where there was a woman and a newborn baby. And he said she was sitting there like the Madonna with the baby in her arms, but the implosion had killed them. And he turned to me and he said, you know, he said, the soldiers know that they're going to war. But he said it's the families, the old people who are left home and the, the mothers and the children and the sick and the elderly. He says they are the, the collateral damage. He said they are the ones that you pick up off the street in their parts. And I always remembered what he said because he, when he died at 98 years old, he kept repeating that story. He was so profoundly traumatized by that one picture. I just wanted to share that because there's a sacredness in what you say, Gila, and there's the sacredness and the, and the incredible pain at the loss of a life to war and hate. Our next witness is Yasmina Kolik 
who will speak about the Srebrenica genocide. Yesterday was the 25th anniversary of the genocide of Srebrenica, and myself and Donna Ants were invited to be guests with there. And so I asked you, Yasmina, my dear, to tell us your truth. You're still muted, Jasmina. I'm here. Yes, okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, hi everyone, and thank you so much for having us today and getting together. Here is my student of Bosnian class, Selina Sultan Irish. And she's actively participating. I will tell you my poem about Srebrenica mother that I wrote in 2015 while I was fasting month of Ramadan. It's called Agony of Srebrenica mother. It's hot, scorching, sultry. The air is burning. We are waiting thousands of Bosnian souls. Mothers cries, children screams sharp words from the mouths of wolves, turning agony of waiting into hell. Mother, they just took father, and my brothers and uncles and even grandpa mother. Ah, millions. I cry, bringing hands in despair, looking toward the sky, not breathing. They will take me too. I hear the voice of my youngest son. Don't let them take me. Mother, don't give me to them. Put our kerchief on my head so they will believe I'm a little girl. Hide me, please. Don't fear, my dear. I will never give you up. They won't take you. You are just a little child. Don't fear. Don't fear. Stick with me. Closer. Your mother will never give up, apple of my eye. You leave the child, a sharp voice stab me in the heart. Don't take him, he is still a child. Don't take him, he is not yet 14. Don't leave me, mother. My dear mom, tell them, tell them again, please. I don't want to go there to the other side with father, with my brothers, uncles, grandpa. No, no, I cry too. No, I beg you. They snatched him from my arms. They took my youngest one my abid. I stood there petrified watching him leave, cursing him one more time with my eyes. He was not 14 yet. It's hot, scorching, sultry. The air is burning and they find Chetnik's monsters are giving chocolates to the little ones to stop them from crying. Oh God, what kind of souls do they have? Then on that July 11th, 1995, and also yesterday and today and tomorrow, and until the moment when that comes to take me, the hands of my youngest son, 
Abby will tremble in my stomach and in my chest. Don't forgive them, mother. I hear the message of my sons. Don't forgive them unless they confess in a loud voice. Don't forgive them until they admit that we exist no longer. That there is nobody to bury you one day when you die. That is always somewhere around me. It knows my name. It hears its voice. I hear its voice. Sophia, you have to leave. You have to talk louder, louder, even louder. They must hear you now since they did not hear you then in July 1995. It's your debt, Sophia. It's your debt to your children, to all of them who are not with you anymore. It's your debt to Srebrenica, to Bosna Srebrna. I will come one day, said that. You will be happy to see me. You will greet me with a smile like your dearest friend. And it left again. I know that I have a debt. Because of that, I'm still alive. I walk, I talk for the genocide in Srebrenica and in our homeland, never to be forgotten. Thank you so much for hearing my poem. And thank you all for organizing this. I'm Yasmina, member of Bosnian community and doing those services for years. And I'm personally survivor of this war. Thank you, my dear. You are welcome. Every, every time I hear you, my heart breaks. I hope so, it wasn't too long. No, you're fine. Thank you. We just need to take a breath for a second or two before we go on to the next theme. I was at the uh, memorial yesterday and they had pairs of shoes displayed. And one of them was the actual boots of one of the people who was killed. And they're little shoes from the little children. And the music and that poem written on my heart. And so we move to the next theme, which is hard to do because it's the theme of hope. There are people out there in organizations in the world who work for the betterment of people in countries where life is hard and unsafe. Our next speaker is Adrian Weeb, who has lived and worked with the people of Guatemala and who will talk about the group called Change for Children, uh, who has fundraisers every year in Edmonton and, and goes to Guatemala personally to help set up schools and healthcare centers. Adrienne, please. Um, good morning. My name is Adrienne Weeb, as Audrey, Reverend Aubrey said. I hope, can, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Very difficult to follow that story with something about hope. But I would like to start with a poem by Emily Dickinson, who wrote about hope almost 200 years ago and wrote this little, this poem. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. The Quetzal bird is the national bird of Guatemala. 
there's a picture of one of these beautiful birds on the slide that you can see. It is a stunning bird with a long colorful tail that lives in the cloud forests in the mountains of Guatemala. They're very elusive birds. I once walked for several hours in a forest before catching a glimpse of a tail of one of these birds. <clears throat> I have been told that the Quetzal bird cannot survive in ca captivity. This bird dies if put in a cage. It can only survive and thrive living freely in the lush misty forests of Guatemala. What a beautiful and yet sad image of hope for the people of Guatemala. The indigenous people of Guatemala, mostly Mayan peoples, have lived through several experiences of genocide. 500 years ago, Spanish colonization dissemin disseminated the indigenous population and destroyed their highly evolved culture and society. Centuries of repressive colonial rule followed. After independence from Spain in 1815, the Guatemalan society continued to be very oppressive towards the indigenous peoples. They were the bottom social rung and treated as disposable forced labor on plantations. After decades of military rule and armed conflict erupted in Guatemala in the 1980s, the Mayan people bore the brunt of the violence as they were suspected and accused of being insurgents. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed and other hundreds of thousands were internally displaced or made refugees. Three quarters of these people were Mayan. During the 1980s, over 400 Mayan villages were massacred by military forces. These were civilian communities in which all the houses and fields were burned and all the inhabitants, including the children, were killed. Often the people were crowded into the village church and it was set on fire. Since the peace accords in 1996, the country has slowly begun to rebuild physically, socially, and psychologically. Despite continued racism, inequality, and poverty, the Mayan people of Guatemala cannot be caged or kept repressed. <clears throat> During the years that I've been involved in Guatemala since the mid-1990s until today, I have seen dramatic signs of hope. In the early 1990s, almost 100% of the teachers in the Mayan communities were, were from outside the community. They were Spanish speakers who could not speak the Mayan language. Today, Almost 100% of the teachers are Mayans and they speak bilingual, they teach bilingually in Spanish and the Mayan language and they work to build and maintain the pride in their culture. It's been a complete reversal. In the 1990s, the average level of education was primary school, if any. Today, at least half of the young people complete high school and many are going on to university and to become professionals. In the early 1990s, the majority of the people lived, uh, traveled to the coast to work on um, sugar and coffee plantations, earning less than a dollar a day. Today, one rarely sees trucks of migrant workers heading to the coast. Since the 1990s, the indigenous peoples have begun to stand up against international corporations and outside forces intent on exploiting their land including holding community referendums to reject mining in their communities and building local cooperatives to improve the sale of their agricultural produce. Change for Children is an Edmonton-based community development organization that accompanies and supports communities to increase food security, improve education, improve livelihoods, and strengthen cultural identity and equality. We continue to work with them. Um, we've been working for more than 20 years in local community development. And now the, our partner organizations that we work with are managed by the young people. Well, they were young people when I knew them in the 1990s, and now they're the adults leading their communities to a better future. So truly, hope, like the Quetzal bird in Guatemala, is a bird that cannot be caged, but rather finds a way to continue to live freely and to sing despite obstacles and suffering and to create a better world 
of peace with justice. Thank you. And thank you, Adrian. And I hope that when your next fundraiser comes up that you'll make sure that the Edmonton Interface Center gets that information and uh, we can participate. You managed to do a lot of fundraising and, and the food's good too. Thank you. Oh, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now we have the Soul Singer Circle of Edmonton. And I have to admit and confess that I'm a part of that group. Uh, sing songs of hope, freedom, peace, and the major goal is building a community all over the world. Our director, Karen Porca, has managed to keep us singing in these times of, of crisis by using our friend Zoom. And she'll direct the singers in Ella's song and will use American Sign Language as taught to us for this song. You're on. Karen. And there we are. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you so much, Audrey. It is such an honor to be here. Um, uh, if you uh, look out, maybe I can ask all the singers to give a little wave. Audrey is one of our singers as well. We sang um, Ella's song this past term. I want to give acknowledgement to the words of, um, it was by uh, civil rights activist Ella Baker and black rights activist um, uh, wrote these words that inspired uh, Bernice Johnson Regan of Sweet Honey and the Rock um, to create the song. It is very singable. So the singers will be singing um, sonically, sending their healing messages in and we invite you to sing at home. Um, leaving your your on mutes though as much as we want to hear your voices uh, we will feel it energetically and i also want to acknowledge um amarina bartlett who is a woman from our deaf community in edmonton who um, shared the american sign language uh, movement so you're welcome to sign along with us in ella's song <laughs> We who believe in freedom, freedom can rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mothers' sons. We who believe in freedom cannot Rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Cause to me young people come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I could but shed some light, does they carry us through the gale? We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice and I must be heard. At times I can be quite difficult about no man's word. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Audrey. 
Thank you, Karen. We now have a time for reflection. We've covered a lot of intense material and I think it's time for us to just take a breath and see some slides from one of the services. Uh, originally it started out with 30 people and now it has got to such a great uh, number of attendees that it's moved from my front yard to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. And last year we stopped counting at 110 people because more people came in after we uh, started the service. So um, we'll have those slides now, Karen. This lady is from the Congo. Brian Colley and Karen Mills from the church. Brian Colley was our minister. This fellow is from, uh, I believe it's Kurdistan. It's a Muslim speaker. Ann Barker from the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. This is the only time that it went indoors because of the weather. And this is Elder Pauline Paulson having a uh, smudge. We have a smudge at every uh, service. And this is Jasmina and her family and people from the Cultural Association. And my beloved Sebastian Burrara, who is with the Create Art Project in Edmonton. And now we have Reg, Reverend Fulgens, Fulgens uh, Najid Mana from the Saskatoon Congregation, where he's the associate minister there. Um, I have to say that uh, I have planned my themes. And then I got this video from the Saskatoon uh, congregation. And what uh, Fulgent says is so powerful, exactly what I would have wanted to say myself and couldn't. So we, we have a, a poor video connection, so we'll hear him uh, speak to us. You can go ahead with the slide. Hope is not just waiting. But hope is the work to transform things real for some into things real for all. In this meaning, hope is a form of active resistance. In my life and in my ministry, I have had the privilege to journey alongside people for whom the hope I'm working towards is real. The people on my journey, this particular group, they are not victims of police racial profiling. Their names do not raise red flags on their job applications. And they trust various public institutions to be there for them when they need them. And whenever I needed these people on my journey, they put their lives on the line. They use their resources their connections, and yes, their skin color to help me get places and to help those being open. To bring about the kind of hope I'm dreaming about, we need more of these people. We need more of these allies to take the risk to be on the side of people who are hurting. And to all my friends and allies, especially those with privilege and power, 
I tell them we are in this for the long haul. This is a fight that has been going on for generations and will probably go on for more time to come. I invite everyone to stay in the game with this simple but not simple invitation. Despite the discomfort, listen to the people who are screaming. Partake in their pain. We may gather valuable information and discover where it really hurts. Eventually, you will hopefully not ask what to do because through listening, conversations and relationships, choices become obvious. Do what you can, where you are, with what you have learned. Choices will probably include to unlearn prejudice towards certain groups, to challenge systems of injustice, to renounce power and control, to share resources, to challenge friends and family, and many other choices. Do the hard things the right way. Build a community, really. A community is a myth when people are selfish when they look after only their interests. The community is a myth when a city or a country is divided between citizens and disposable human capitalist assets. We, do, we need to do our part. The arc of the universe does not just bend towards justice. And as one journalist recently wrote, nothing bends towards justice without us bending it. Faith communities, like the faith community we are part of, have an important role to play to bring about that change that we are all working towards. We have, as a faith community, principles and values that motivate, motivate us to do the right thing. I'm actually excited about the work ahead because I believe that is where the seeds of hope are planted. That is where resistance awaits. That's where change will happen. I say thank you to Reverend Fulgens Nagijimana because here was the man who was a refugee from Burundi his Unitarian congregation was driven out. He was jailed and tortured. Yet we have his words on the concept of hope and how powerful and how it moves us to examine where we stand in the line of responsibility and dedication to make de changes. The words that in the video that drew me to his, to his words 
where hope is an act of resistance. How powerful. Words to contemplate in the concept of allies. Been hearing lately about the idea, who are we as white people to talk about being allies to the indigenous people? And yet, Fulgence talks exactly about how without those of us who stand up, speak out, let her write, and do all those kinds of things, where would he have been today? He would have been dead. We were able to help because we cared. And it's not good for us to feel cautious about stepping forward as allies, because his words tell us there's no such thing as offending the one who needs help. Our next bringer of hope through word and song is Royland Piku, who has walked beside me through many uh, services, who has a special way of sharing love, peace, and hope. Royland, it's your turn. Hello, can you guys hear me? We sure can. Okay, well, uh... I got to start off with a story that takes a time in uh, BC. And uh, this is not before Christ, but this is before COVID. So once upon a time, there was a minister in Harlight Park doing a sermon. And uh, she's talking about uh, neighbor. Who's your neighbor and, and the power of love and hope. And, uh, Someone in the audience asked the minister, well, who is my neighbor? And uh, the minister went on to, uh, to say that, uh, well, let me tell you a story. And it takes place in Edmonton. So in Edmonton, in the River Valley, you know, there's some parts of the River Valley that can be quite, uh, you know, secluded and, and could be dangerous if you're traveling along. And, uh, one nice Sunday morning, uh, people were going through the River Valley and there was a beautiful young Muslim woman who had been burglarized, beaten, and, and probably raped. And uh, one of the uh, Edmontonians passed by and uh, said, well, you know, she's Muslim and I'm Christian and maybe a Muslim person can help her. And off he went to one of his Christian services. And then uh, another passerby came and uh, they saw the Muslim lady and they said, well, that's none of my business. I'm going to stay out of it. I don't want to get myself in trouble. Maybe I'll call on my cell phone and report it. And off they went to, uh, to see an Edmonton Eskimo game. But then there was a, a young native man coming through and he saw the Muslim woman and he had compassion on her and, he's, and he went over and he helped her and he, he, he got her up out of the valley and he brought her up to, the, uh, to a facility where she could get help. And he uh, said, if there's any charges, please charge it to, to, my, to my account, charge it to my, my MasterCard. And uh, the minister said, now, who do you think was the neighbor to, to, to this particular Muslim lady? And, you know, a little child said, I think it was the native man. And uh, the minister said, go and do likewise. And so, you know, that there is the story of hope there because that I'm sure that young woman was laying there hoping, praying that someone would have compassion on her and see her. And the other people who came, uh, they saw her, but they only saw another. Whereas when the native man came, he saw himself there because he remembered what his elders had taught him about the interconnectedness of life and that we're all connected by a web and what affects one affects all. So he knew this act of compassion and this witnessing of hope and interconnectedness would help heal the world. 
And so later when the uh, lady was asked, uh, what do you think saved you? And uh, she just did this little song and she just started saying, Love lifted me. Love lifted me. And nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. And nothing else could help. Love lifted me. So that was a little preview to my other song. What I want to share is, uh, and a little story on this song is, uh, there was a young boy on a bus, probably in the 40s, and he was sitting in the back of the bus and him and his mother were sitting in the back of the bus and they pulled the curtain across to separate the black people from the white. And the young boy said he knew at that moment that it was his job to tear that curtain down. So that's the song I'm going to do because I believe for us to have true hope that we have to tear that curtain down of separation and fear in our hearts. We have to rip it apart and we have to come together as one. And that is my hope that that love will lift us and help us tear that curtain down. So we're going to tear that curtain down. And did you say you're going to send that to us, Roiland? That, uh, send what to you? You said you're going to send the song. Yeah, that is the song. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good, yeah, good. Thank you. That's Thank you so much. Okay, say hello to welcome. Diana for me. Bye-bye. All right. Will do. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I just have to announce that I have to go. I have two kids that I need to feed. Okay, thanks, Jasmina. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our next, our final theme today is one of interconnectedness. And we've already seen that uh, expressed here a couple times today. Uh, I was blessed to be sent a blog on this very topic uh, after I had chosen it because uh, Rabbi David Kunin uh, posted it on his blog from Tokyo just before he uh, left to take up his new calling in Syracuse, New York. We're kind of afraid that the, the connection might not be so good. So he did send a video, but so glad David to see you. Now please take over. Thank you, Audrey. I'm just gonna share some, oh wait, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, share my screen briefly. Yeah. I want to talk, oh, first of all, um, do you, does everybody see the picture? Yes. Great. I want to talk quickly about a festival that was held every year, that's held every year in Nico, not this year, sadly, 
but Nikko is a small community north of Tokyo, and it uh, covers a wide neighborhood of communities, not some richer, some poorer, um, some very um, high class, some very um, lower class group areas. And they all come together every year for a festival. And the festival is amazing. Usually at a Japanese festival, you'll have carts, as you see in the picture. And every neighborhood will have a different cart and they'll all be, and they'll all compete. So you'll have really fancy ones and very simple ones, very fancy costumes and very simple costumes. And you can tell what are the rich neighborhoods and what are the poor neighborhoods. But in Nico, they decided that every little community, and they're about 16, would have an identical float. So each community made an identical float. All the costumes are identical. And they parade through the town every year on two different days. And they end up at a beautiful shrine to celebrate the end of the festival. And then representatives from each of the little communities go to all of the other carts and they bow and they offer words of greeting and congratulations. And what this festival really does is it unites the community, reminding them that whatever their socioeconomic class, they are all interconnected. They're equally important parts of the community of Nico. And for me, that's what we need to remember as we think about ourselves as religious communities, that we're all part of a single community. We're part of the world. And that's something that's hard to remember in this time of COVID, but it's essential to remember. And I think for me, and this was where Audrey um, saw the blog that I had written, the coronavirus has served with tragic results as a reminder to us about our interconnectedness. If you think about it, nations have tried to close their borders, hoping to isolate themselves from the pandemic. And we can see how well that's worked. And like a steamroller, people, especially the elderly, in nation after, not only the elderly, but the poor as well, in nation after nation, have suffered the effects of this deadly virus. I would hope that the outcome of the pandemic would be a stronger self of our sense, excuse me, of our global interconnection, but I don't see that happening. I don't see us connecting up, but instead I see a continuing sense of isolation. Cooperation doesn't seem to be what people are choosing. Instead, we close our borders and we reach towards hate. It's not only in Canada that people are prejudiced against Asian American Asians during this virus, but all across the globe, in Australia, in Japan, in the United States, everywhere, people are targeting others of different ethnicity because of the COVID virus. And if we think also of the socioeconomic terms about the people that are hit hardest, people from the indigenous communities across the globe are being hit hard. If we try to separate out the virus and its effects from poverty and injustice, we can't do it because it's all one. Our sense of connectedness has to remind us that all of these issues are connected and that we have a responsibility as global society, as a global community to try to bridge all of these differences and to try to remember that we're all connected. If we think about how even a simple thing like wearing a mask has become a political issue, we can see the tragedy of a failure of sense of responsibility. And that's what we need to reclaim, is a sense of interconnectedness, a sense of responsibility. I wear a mask not to protect myself, but rather to protect you. And that's even more important than protecting myself. Religions can be a uniting force in solving the problems of the world. We can bring hope at a time when people need hope the most. We can bring a sense of unity when people need unity the most. Yet often, religions are self-serving ourselves. We offer answers that focus on our own political agendas. We often answer 
give answers that focus only on our own particular communities. And then we say, oh, we need our churches and synagogues and temples to reopen. We're so important, reminding or forgetting rather that people when they gather together are most threatened. So we need to find creative ways instead of thinking that we're so important that we need to gather together. Zoom is a much better way to bring hope and comfort at a time when gathering is dangerous. We need to have a unity of purpose to join together in services like this. I remember Audrey's early services in her garden. They were amazingly powerful events. And this kind of service even more as we reach across the globe is an amazingly powerful event. It allows people from many different religious traditions to gather together to offer hope and comfort. And I think we need to continue to do this, to be strong, to remember that we are interconnected. And when we act together, when we act as human religions coming together to serve God and serve humankind, then I think we can't be defeated. Though we call upon God using many different names and looking God in many different ways, we need to remember our universal care for humanity and our universal care for the world in which we dwell. We need to be responsible to overcome the socioeconomic boundaries that divide us. We need to overcome the differences that drive us apart. And instead, as we celebrate our diversity, also point to a path of hope for the future of humanity, where we're built on a sense of interconnection and joint responsibility. Thank you very much, Audrey, for allowing me. I miss Japan, and um, I think when I was, I was in Japan when you asked me, and in some ways I still feel like I'm in Japan, but now I'm in Syracuse and facing new challenges. Mm -hmm. I hope that you're going to continue your wonderful blogs and that people will connect with you to uh, listen to them, see your wonderful artwork, and uh, build a relationship with us now that you're no longer in Tokyo. I've kept all of the, the art uh, pieces that you've sent uh, on the line, and I hope to see more. Blessings to you and your furry friends and to Shelley. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Audrey. Now, the next part of the service is the placing of the memorial stones. Now, we can't go into the garden and do that because we're on Zoom. But I wanted to introduce you to Nene, who is the most wonderful calico cat I've ever seen. And because we were washing the stones and placing them for this slide, she came over and she sat there as if to, she's like as if she's meditating over the stones. And so I asked that this slide be there. The first stone that will be placed here in this garden is for the Ugar Muslims of East Turkestan which was uh, taken over by China and renamed Xinjiang. The majority population there of 10 million Uyghurs are being forced to assimilate, and this will sound familiar, forced to assimilate by destroying their culture and religion through torture, harvesting of organs, and having their children taken away for re-education into the Han Chinese group. Over 1 million Uyghurs are being destroyed as we speak. The second stone has already been mentioned today because of the children, the billions and billions of children over the history of this world who are murdered by those in power in order that the family units cannot succeed and to ensure the nations are destroyed. Killing children in the most horrible ways possible and enjoying it. And I won't even describe how some of those things happen. I think you can just stop that CD, uh, Karen. Uh, killing children in the most horrible way possible and enjoying it is the first action, the first action against families. And you know that the second one is rape. Let us hold the children whose names are going to be memorialized on the stone, the billions of children who are murdered all over the world, 
who will never have a future, and who will never have a life, and who, like with Jasmine, Jasmina, will forever sit in her heart, the children, the uncles, the grandfathers, the husbands, who died in that massacre, 8,700 and some people massacred within a very short time. Let us hold those children who will never have their future in our hearts. And let us never stay silent about crimes against humanity. We have the John Humphrey Center for Peace here in Edmonton that works so hard to bring that philosophy forward and to have classes and workshops and things. And there are the uh, multicultural uh, associations and synagogues and churches and, and places of worship and City Hall, who allows us our space for the International Day for Ending Racism on, on September the 21st. Every year that's sponsored by the Edmonton Interface Center and the City of Edmonton. There are opportunities for us to be those allies. It is our birthright to be safe and to thrive. And I don't care where it is in the world, it's just Timbuktu or, or Sabrinitsa or Burundi or uh, Iqaluit, wherever it is, we have a right to be safe and to thrive. And we must, must, must work to make it so. I was listening to CBC last Saturday to an interview with singer and activist Pete Seeger. Years ago, he sent me pages he ripped out of his songbook because I was living up in northern Manitoba and couldn't get the lyrics off of uh, his uh, record. Very kindly just ripped his music out and sent it to me. Now, this was a man who was jailed a few times and was called a left wing nut because of his music and his words and for his work for peace. He said that, it, he said this, he said it, it will be when millions and millions and millions of small organizations in the world come together to keep pressure on governments, that any kind of change will be made. He also said that unless this happens, the world will no longer exist. Today, we've heard from some of those millions of organizations with the change for children and with the uh, uh, work that Jasmina's group is doing. And also my friend Emmanuel Guitar from Rwanda who has the Yego project there. Uh, he was at uh, uh, St. Stephen's College when we were on the academic board, uh, uh, David. A wonderful man who also was part of the hope and the mission to educate and to help the people there. So in this last closing part, I'm inviting two people who represent organizations that work for peace. The first one is Nicole and Gibire, who is with the Mem Memory Keepers of Rwanda. She's going to say a few words about their work. And then Elira Stefaniuk from the Westwood Unitarian Congregation who is the uh, religious education director there and is also a published poet. So I'll let Nicole begin, please, Nicole. Is Nicole there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Oh, Hi, Nicole. How Hi. lovely it is thank to you meet you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Brooke. <laughs> yeah, um, I was saying I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, when the genocide uh, against the Tutsi of Rwanda happened in 1994, I was only eight years old. Um, but the, the, the impact of the genocide really goes on even to the next generation. Um, the the only thing that resonates with me every time I wonder what were the adults doing at that time? Um, there were those that were being um, killed. There were those that were killing people. But there were also so many millions of bystanders who were doing nothing. 
Um, so I, I want to encourage all of us. The killings are still happening in this world. Um, genocides are still happening. They're probably not called genocide yet. The UN hasn't uh, given it that name yet, but there are still so many genocides happening around this world. What are we doing as adults? Um, we hold the big countries uh, accountable when things are happening in this world. We, we hold UN accountable and they should, have, they, should be, they should be held accountable. But also us, as individuals, what do we do? Because I, I, I truly believe that each one of us can do something uh, as little as can be to stop the, stop the wrongdoing in this world. Um, I, I wish my English was better to, to, to emphasize what I'm saying or what I want to say, but I hope you understand me. It, we, I, I really want us to, it, every, every platform we have, as small as it is or big as it is, to use it to speak up against the wrongdoings, the killings, the genocides that are happening in this world. It's still happening in so many countries of Africa and so many countries of Asia. But so many times we go on, on our days and we just stay busy in our own lives and we look aside um, just because it's not concerning us. It's not affecting us directly. Let us not be bystanders. Let us not just look away. Let us do something. Because I really hope, I wish that when it was happening in my country, people could have done something. Maybe could have saved some of my cousins. Maybe could have saved a few kids that I used to play with. Um, if somebody somewhere had, had done something, speak up, do something. Use your platform as big as it can be or as small as, as it is. Thank you very much. That was what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for being here and being with us and I hope that from now on we have a, a long uh, connection between the memory keepers and with the genocide memorial because we have to keep the witness over and over and over as the small things that we can do to help. Thank you and I thank you thank all you. for joining us today in this first virtual genocide memorial service it would not have happened without the invitation of the Canadian Unitarian Council to, to present it and the Unitarian Church of Edmonton to uh, encourage me to put it together and uh, the Interfaith Centre who has always supported this program along with the many other things that the Centre does. Uh, once again, David is president of that organization and I also see Etta Follett, our, our administrator. Uh, maybe some of you could join those organizations that are working toward peace as a small step in that direction. I know that I, I could not have done this without the help of the many volunteers who put their hours and hours in to see it happen. And my favorite volunteer was uh, Helen Billita, who uh, I would say wiped my nose and burped me like a small child with regard to technology. Um, I guess I could call her Saint Billida if I believed in that kind of thing, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to her now. Uh, she's going to take over the announcements. And after that, there will be a postlude called the uh, Wintry Lullaby. And uh, one of our church members who has a beautiful voice, a professional voice, uh, Aaron Vanderbilt Tater, with Gordon Ritchie, who you saw in the background playing the harp as her background, will be the final part of the program. Thank you for being with us. And I've been told that I'm the only person in North America doing the genocide memorial service. And if it is in your heart, in your, your place of uh, worship, or your, your life, your yard, and you want some help with uh, setting one up, I am certainly available to help you with that. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for Kimberly, my daughter, for helping with the, the, the program, for my son Jay for attending, uh, sending love and uh, interconnectedness to all Audrey, of you. Audrey, can I interrupt? Um, <coughs> yes. I think we I think we missed Ilara's poem. I really wanted. Oh, to Ilara's oh poem. yes. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I got taken up with uh, with uh, Nicole. 
Thank you for reminding me. Oh, Alara, my darling, where are you? I'm right here, Audrey. Oh, there you go, All my good. dear. No worries. I need your um, poem. I just couldn't live if I left your poem out. <laughs> continuum, continuum. Certainly, yes. I, uh, I just want to say that this poem kind of sums up I think my feelings around interconnection in general and just the, the, the sense of it and the hopeful result that could come of all of the work that we do eventually. So this is Continuum. I am billions of years in the making. These hands took millennia to learn how to hold, how to be enfolded in another's flesh, to feel skin cells departing from my fingers into their palms in the hope that this moment of holding will be remembered in their DNA, passed on, and continue to evolve into deeper love. You are billions of years in the making. Those ears took millennia to learn how to listen to the blood rushing through them and translate the sound into words, heartbeat, pulse rhythm. Those lips took longer to learn how to speak, forming from thought to sound to communication to be caught by another. Ancient magic we unknowingly wield. We are all billions of years in the making. These ideas and hearts took millennia to create, let we yet we count our lifetimes in minutes, days, years, so easily forgetting that our blood is ancient ocean water and we are all one with our tides. Thank you. Thank you so much, my darling. And I'm all, I'm asking all of the people who read today to send me their uh, copies, hard copies, to put in the Genocide Memorial Archives, please. Thank you. And now I turn it over. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you, everyone that participated today. I'm glad that we have come together to share our deepest concerns, speaking and singing words of inspiration and hope. We have pledged to work for a more just world ourselves and the generations to come. We went a little off script at the beginning and I do want to still acknowledge that at, here in Edmonton we do gather together on Treaty 6 land. And it's important for us to recognize that a treaty is inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to our children. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is self-governing and self-supporting. We rely on donations to support our staff and programs. We're very happy that we've been able to keep staff employed and we are keeping our utility bills paid. We do depend on renters, which we don't have. We would appreciate any donation that you can provide. You can go to canadahelp.org, ATV Cares, or our website, ute.ca, to give anything that you are willing or able to share. Normally, every Sunday, we don't collect money for a different charity. Because we're not meeting in person, we hope that you will go to the, into the charity's website. For the month of July, we normally collect for SEEK, which is the Center to End All Sexual Exploitation. Please visit ceasenow.org to learn more about their organization and donate what you can. <laughs> This is 
been a very emotional service, but I want everyone to remember that humor is important. Everyone across the world is welcome to join us for our humor social night on Wednesday. You can find the links to our Zoom meetings at the uce.ca calendar website. We hope that you can join us um, as well as the next service, which is led by Susan Rattan, a UCE member and a former CUC board member. Uh, how has the pandemic isolation changed you? Sounds like a very interesting service. And again, you can find links on the website calendar. On July 26, Steph Jenkins will lead the service, Any Bowl Can Be a Challenge, I think is a lovely thought. After the postlude, we will have coffee hour, so you can join us. Everyone go for a bio break, grab a glass of water, grab a coffee, go to the bathroom, and then come back and we will assign breakout rooms so we can have smaller group conversations. Please join us now in listening to the post route Wintry Lullaby by UCE members Gordon Ritchie and Aaron Vandermol and Peter. <laughs> Now be still. 